Welcome everyone, joining us to a virtual spotlight presentation with the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network. Uh, my name is Ken Long, the chairperson of the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network, and I'm really appreciative to be sharing this time with you all right now. Our session today is physically being recorded on Ghana Country, the traditional owners of the Adelaide Plains in South Australia. I would like to pay my respects to the Ghana people and all First Nations people from wherever you are viewing this presentation today and acknowledge our First Nations communities uh, past, present and emerging. The ASBN truly uh, cherishes our in-person events uh, to connect our community and to engage in diverse conversations around sustainability and the built environment and various different issues uh, uh, in conjunction with the things that we build, we design, um, and how we live. Uh, however, with the monumental shifts due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, uh, we do actually think that we're fortunate to have this opportunity to broadcast our conversation here. Um, so we are uh, shifting our own uh, methodologies to engage with our conversations. This is our first foray into streaming, streamed recordings, so we'd really appreciate any of, any of your feedback on how, to, how you find the format as well. Uh, additionally, because it is a virtual stream and broadcast, we hope you can participate by leaving comments and questions in the chat stream. Uh, we will collate the questions and have a future follow-up session with our presenter addressing them at a later time. So our session today is uh, focused on bushfire resiliency. Uh, with the horrific summer of bushfires across Aus Australia, we have experienced firsthand the magnitude of future threats uh, which are connected with climate change. Uh, while bushfires are a known danger in Australia, the, the past intensity of bushfires uh, across Australia showcase how we need to adapt our approach to building and development and uh, uh, community in bushfire prone areas uh, to address future climate change threats. While the design and the building of homes and communities are not the only part of the equation, um, there's a lot of different uh, aspects to all the, uh, how to become more bushfire resilient. It is a component of becoming more res uh, resilient to the changing climate conditions and risks and necessary for a more sustainable living future. For our session today, we'll be joined by Emilis Pergauskas, who will take us through a whole range of measures which can help to increase the resiliency of our community in bushfire situations. The discussion will reinforce that there is no such thing as a bushfire uh, proof home in many areas. However, there are vast improvements that can be made in how we as a community approach our present preparations for the inevitable increasing intensity of the fires. So to introduce uh, our presenter, um, uh, Emilis Pergauskas, uh, so during bushfires, Emlis steps up to provide logistic support to veterinarians in the South Australian Tier 2 Animal Triage Support Agency, uh, SAVEM. -E he has deployed to uh, 16 fire grounds in the last decade, including post-fire pro bono service assistance on recovery committees to fire impacted uh, families. In the usual day-to-day, -day, Emlis is a 47-year veteran architect, also ref refereed as a commissioner on the Environment, Resources, and Development Court of South Australia. He has a portfolio of buildings designed and occupied in fire-prone areas, with some destroyed and some surviving bushfire events. And he'll go into this in his presentation as well. He brings his practical uh, built environment legal and academic backgrounds to the evolving uh, issues of buildings and bushfires. In October 2019, he also presented at the Australian Bushfire, uh, Buildings Bushfire Conference in Leora, uh, New South Wales. 
And uh, because of his vast experience in this sort of era, we are very um, uh, fortunate to have Emelis uh, bring his experience and knowledge uh, to this particular topic. Once again, um, as you are viewing this uh, stream, please make sure to leave any uh, comments and questions in the chat stream so we can uh, work with Emelis to uh, address them at a later time. Thank you, and welcome Emelis. Hello, I'm Emelis Progaskas. The reason I'm the talking head on this topic of buildings and bushfire will become obvious as, pre as this presentation proceeds. In this session, I'll be talking about a diverse range of contributory matters before I give some examples of buildings that have survived bushfire. And then I'll try and tie the whole thing together. I ask you to make your own notes to help us or when the Q&A comes later. I have a number of warning notes. This is a confronting subject. The intent of this broadcast is to be informative. It's not intended to be controversial or traumatic. But inevitably for some, this broadcast could well be. Step away if what's being talked about causes you to be uncomfortable. For these reasons, there will not be any visuals of destroyed buildings in this presentation. For some of the matters raised, however, will seem weird and off topic. Please bear with me take it all on board, and hopefully I can make the relevance of each clear as we go along. The common wisdom is that protecting buildings in bushfire is simple. Every time we have a bushfire, we simply increase the minimum stringency in building regulation. There's a fallacy in this approach. Across Greater Metropolitan Adelaide, there are already about 650,000 houses, and we build about 6,000 new ones annually. Let us assume for the moment that every new house replaces an existing one. Even then, to get herd immunity through a significant number of houses across the urban and peri-urban area to be at today's minimum compliance level, this will take at least a century in new builds to achieve. Meanwhile, most of the buildings potentially under bushfire threat continue to be from built-in standards from years ago. And some of, when you, some of you are going to say, hey, hang on, most of those houses are in suburbia, and I say, precisely. As this presentation will show, current escalation of bushfire does mean that in suburban fires have, that have already occurred in other places are increasingly likely here, which is why I have to introduce a number of contributing matters before we get to the main game. The header to this slide is a little bit light-hearted, but there is a further reason for the slide, which is of the slide itself, the photo is of the Animal Triad Centre at Pandana in the Ravine Fire. It's to remind us that bushfire is not attacking you, it's not attacking your house, it's attacking the whole community. And the only way bushfire is controlled and contained is by community-wide action. I'm going to be using a lot of emergency services language like control, attack, preparation, preparedness, response, recovery. Because over the last decade, I've been in 16 fire grounds. Firstly, as a tier two responder, and afterwards sitting on recovery committees, helping the impacted families with insurance claims, regulatory approvals, and builder contract issues. It's from this background that I argue that a bushfire resistant build alone doesn't materialise in houses surviving bushfire. The increasing intensity, speed, and scale of bushfire puts paid to that. This slide shows four tier two agencies working together doing the animal triage parts of the bushfire response. They're part of 30 or so agencies in the fire ground. That leaves the tier one first responder volunteer firefighters to focus entirely on their job, which is putting wet stuff on the red stuff. And as you'll come to see as we go onwards, every household has a part to play in resourcing those firefighters. The other message from this slide is the building itself. What you're looking at is a Covertex NZ air shelter, and it has no bushfire resistance whatsoever. Yet it's been pitched right in the middle of the hazard. Because of its portability, its ease of use and ability to be erected long term, as it is in military and refugees applications all over the planet, means it is fit for purpose. And so in this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about fire fitness. The coming slide talks about the black swan. Now, I need to introduce that term. In the 1700s, European seafarers represented the peak of civilization, at least in their own minds. They believed fervently in scientific method as they then understood it, as well as their right to go over the horizon and conquer the people who lived there. Their belief extended to having only ever seen white swans in their history and place, and thus it must be so everywhere. Until the Dutch ship poked its brow into the western side of this continent. 
The first reaction by Europeans to pretty much every animal they encountered here was, it's got to be a fake. It can't possibly exist. And the platypus is the classic example. They, they kept looking for the stitch marks in the skin because that sort of animal simply couldn't exist. And so as far as black swans were concerned, they said somebody must have used a texture as a joke. To them, such a thing was unimaginable. In today's society, we call any potential event that is unimaginable to us a black swan. We've already had a number of these in our lifetime, planes being flown into buildings, too big to fail financial institutions that have failed, and the pandemic we're in right now. I'll translate the bottom, slide, bottom of this slide, which says, just because you haven't ever seen or conceived of it doesn't mean it isn't going to confront you. And this applies equally to bushfire, which means that today's bushfire attack rating and compliance minima don't stop catastrophic fires from coming as a reality. I've now moved on to the slide, which is a pick from the CFS website of the 2019-20 local bushfire scene at the point where the Yorktown fire has already been contained, that was top left of the slide, and the Calera fire is off on the bottom right hand of the map. What you're seeing on the slide at the top is the Cudley Creek fire, a fire of about normal dimensions. 25,000 hectares burnt, a week to contain, 100 family homes destroyed and some death including my own long-term consulting engineer, Ron Self. At the bottom of the fire ground are the three Kangaroo Island fires, Menzies, Duncan and Ravine, with Ravine completing the fire scar at 22 days to contain, over 200,000 hectares burnt, in our terms, a black swan. The reason this is important is now that we have had such a catastrophic fire in the context of fires across Australia, now it is imaginable, which means that the next black swan whatever that might be, precisely because it is unimaginable. We don't know when, how large, how intense, but by definition, it's going to be multiples larger than what we've already had. So I'm going to hypothesise a fire for you. Off this map, you can, you can see it below the Cudley Creek fire. Let's say it's about the same size as the Ravine fire. And it goes Gawler, Anstey's Hill, Campbelltown, Burnside, Eden Hills. In other words, the Adelaide Hills face zone. But we know that that fire is going to burn outwards. It's going to go into the peri-urban places that we already know might burn. Summertown, Piccadilly, places like that. But what it will also burn is suburban homes. Because each vegetation finger coming out of the hills goes westward through the Torrens Park, Linear Park, and the four creek lines that come out of the hills. So burning things like Kensington Gardens and possibly even Cottage Park. This is quite imaginable. And you're going to say to me, that can't possibly be a reality because those are building areas that have zero bushfire protection or water defences. The slide I've just put up describes for Adelaide exactly what has already happened in Canberra in 2003. A forest fire out in the rural lands, which over a period of a week built to a scale where it started to generate its own weather system through a pyrocumulus uh, thunderstorm, which then edit, entered the Canberra suburbs and took out about 500 homes. Now, fighting a fire in suburbia is quite a different matter. There's no bushfire-resistant construction, there's no stored water other than what can be pumped through the mains, and there are large numbers of people screaming, running away, while the firefighters are trying to get in. So fire-resistant construction at that point is the least of the elements needed in this circumstance. So when we consider the building performance issue of resistance to bushfire, it's important to think beyond minimum compliance beyond non-combustible construction and include other positive contributors. So, if you're designing a building for bushfire, you have to think about not only the project and the site, you have to think about the people. Never suggest to a client, no matter what level of inbuilt fire resistance is included, that a building is bushfire proof. The fire on day can well be much more intense than anywhere so far known and the bail rating that has been given for that area. Don't assume that people want to stay and defend, even those who've been through bushfire before. The emergency service has one simple priority, the protection of human life. Where asset protection is a lower order priority, only when it contributes positively to the major priority. And that includes the firefighters themselves. There is a reason why the fire truck is parked facing away from the fire. If the situation becomes untenable, the hoses are dropped and the truck with its group is out of there. So clients have to stipulate at the time of design, are we leave early people or stay and defend people? 
If it's the latter, the building better have best practice defence and firefighting infrastructure. The mantra here is, what do I tell the coroner were people to perish here? So it's, this is where we get to the three things which contribute to bushfire resistance. Some non-combustibility, yes. A defensible space around the building, absolutely. And a honeypot to attract the firefighters to the place. As to the defensible space, in the eastern states, compliance includes an APZ, an asset protection zone. And this is measured as a distance between the bushland face and the building face. This is not a defensible space, particularly when the occupants grow a garden between the two. And that then in turn simply becomes a wick for the fire to go between the bushland and the building. Let me step sideways for a moment. I have two elephants in the room to talk to you about. The Sydney architect Jerry Leave and then the Institute of Architects offer an architects assist program to fire impacted people. You'll notice I haven't canvassed design anywhere so far. In my many years of interaction with fire impacted people, I haven't once dealt with, bush, with building design. Because fire impacted people have just had a life changing experience. All their prior attempts to build for their future, for their kids, for themselves, for their retirement, have suddenly been torn away from them by something they have nil control over. For some, the reaction is, why do I bother anymore? At the other end of the scale, there are people who are very, very angry. And we also remember that the fire impacted communities also have people who've lost nothing and they are suffering what's called survivor guilt. What makes me special that I didn't lose everything just like my neighbour did? Whole communities are suffering. Offering pro bono design isn't high on the priority list for any of these people. What they do need is they need an advocate on their side to argue with the insurance companies who will say, you were underinsured so we don't need to pay you out, with bureaucracy that says you can't possibly have your house back because it doesn't comply, and to argue with builders who have predatory contracts. The research by Dr Rob Gordon says that of those who hurriedly rebuild after bushfire, 40% will sell up and leave their community within two years simply because the house, the new house, isn't home. It has none of those connections that were important to the family. In my own experience, only one in 100 rebuilds is bespoke. All the rest are transportables, kit homes or standard builder plans. And there's very sound reason for this. They fit the payout money from the insurance company. They're quick to approve and to build. And this is what fire impacted people believe they need. To then find out that when someone says to them, aren't you doing well out of this bushfire because you've got a brand new house out of it, that simply doesn't cut it. The house is not home. It's no longer connected to the community. The, the fire took, in human terms, much more than just the buildings. So at the bottom of this slide, I'm telling you the things the architect has to bring to the table, and then there are accreditations that go with this, and I'll come to this again later. The other elephant in the room is Southern Ocean Lodge. And so, for Max Pritchard, who's watching this, in the emergency services terms, it gets one big tick. Nobody died. Yes, the sprinkler system didn't cope. And we had an extraterrestrial intensive fire, which meant that that was not an unreasonable thing for it not to cope with. But the primary structure was still standing, and that's a testament to the time for people to get out. So it gets another tick. I see a lot of buildings post-fire, including some of my own projects, where nothing is left except broken tiles and glass on the bare side. Clients regularly gripe about the cost and ugliness of fire tanks that are a requirement under the compliances. And they want to hide these somewhere out of sight. This particular tank shows a change of heart after a bushfire. It's the Port Lincoln community who came together after the Wangari fire saying, we never want our firefighters to be short of water ever again. So via the service clubs, a sentinel of these tanks is placed around the outside of the town. They're loud and proud sentinels ringing Port Lincoln for the future. And so I encourage my clients to do the same for their own property. The visible tank also says this property is fire fit. It also increases the property value between 20 and $40,000. And yet, even amongst my own work, when the tank is placed where the firefighters can get at it by the front gate, the human predisposition to the hide the ugly still kicks in and they still grow bushes around it. As I alluded to earlier, this fire water is not the homeowner's. If as a homeowner you insist on hanging on to your water, be sure that by the time the fire arrives, it will have grown in speed and intensity beyond the capacity of that little bit of water you've got to make a material difference. 
Much better that a fire truck take that water away from your property to the fire front and potentially stop the fire there, thereby saving your home and your community. This is the kind of mindset change which is being advocated away from the consumerist, it's all about me, and towards me doing my bit for community wellbeing. You will increasingly find this as public discourse as the emergency services move towards advocating prevention and preparedness ahead of response under the overarching title of fire fitness. Property fire fitness includes giving firefighters good access to the property, not just to go in and help asset protection, but to give them confidence that they can get out again. Without that surety, they won't even enter the property in the first place. There's a lot of talk about self-defence using bunkers. This is a fraught territory. There's a 70-page guideline document available from the Australian Building Codes Board, and approvals cannot be given by council. It needs state-level concurrence. The necessary decisions, once you have a bunker, get even harder. No doubt on the fire day will be the day you have your family reunion with a couple of hundred people around and the bunker will hold six people. Your decision, who dies? At the front end of putting bunkers in place, what are the testing proofs that are being provided to you that the bunker will perform? At the sorts of bushfire temperatures we're having, the doors will buckle, the seals will emit toxic gases, and then the issue is who's going to maintain this? On the day, you won't have time to throw the Grange Hermitage out the door to make room for the people. So this is really fraught territory. In my practice, I treat bushfire just like I treat any other building performance item, be that comfort, energy efficiency, longevity, maintenance and so on. So what I'm going to do now is look at four builds that have experienced bushfire and are still in existence. Now be aware their survival this time is not a surety in other circumstances. The examples simply give, and at times contradictory, indicators of what will help. Here is a peri urban house in its winter cloak. The surrounds shout bushfire risk in terms of the vegetation, the slopes, and the wind effects in the multi-direction gullies. The next slide is taken from the front page of the advertiser of the time. It was taken by the neighbours as they were leaving. We can tell that the homeowners have stayed to defend because the kitchen light is on. The house has non-combustible elements and it has firefighting capacity because they would decided to stay and defend. The surrounding land is a watered orchard, therefore it is a defensible space. It's been maintained by the occupants. What the photo doesn't show is the large water tanks off to the left of screen or the bitumen road exiting right of screen and the two fire trucks who came and stayed for several days and sat next to those tanks. This is the western sector of the 2013 Cherryville fire, which went south to the right of the slide and did a lot of damage in Basket Range. The western sector was contained here and so was the house. So it was those three elements working together that made it work. Now I'm going to completely contradict everything that I've just said. This is a house built in the early 80s as a tree change place just for one couple. And so we're here, we're talking about a site which is totally inaccessible to firefighters or anyone else. The, the build itself is earth berm with masonry around the bathroom with its steel door, steel shutters on the clear story windows and handheld fire equipment within the bathroom, i.e. a bunker. Now in this case, the bunker works because it only has to deal with the two people. It's not going to have any other people around. The 2006 Cape Gantuan fire came out of the conservation park heading towards Destries Bay impacting the whole of the tree change community that lives there. The fire intensity was low and the fire was contained. There is, however, an impact that's worth reminding ourselves. When we talk about protection of human life, we're not just talking the physical life, we're talking the emotional and psychological life as well. And in this particular case, she decided she would continue to remain and she would stay there for several more decades. And he said, I knew intellectually what bushfire was, but now that I've seen the 30 metre high flames, I'm out of here. The next project is the property that started all of the thinking about this presentation. It happened a few months ago. Outside Lobel fall on a property which is unlikely to have fire trucks come because the homeowners believed they'd be busy in the town itself, and that, as it was. The owner built house 
where the detail has contributed to the building survival. The owners had maintained the outside by stock eating the grass and they were watering the exterior until driven inside by the fire front. The fire front having come up through the bushland on the northern side and the southern side and then the third attack was up the grass slope towards the house. The fire burned up to the building face with some burn over scorching the colour bond. The south facing clear stories, which you can't see in these photographs, are glass block, so there was no opportunity for glass to be sucked out of the, of the frames on the aft side of the building by the fire, and therefore fire couldn't enter from the, on the downwind side. The exterior joints are all sealed with fire resistant sealant rather than a generic gap sealer. What's visible on the slides is the damage. The air induct to the wood header air supply burnt off, and so some smoke came up those pipes into the inside. The bushfire was intense enough where it had winds that were tugging at the shutters, bowing them outwards and trying to pull them out of their channel guides. And in this case, they were not slimline guides, they were the proper deep guides. The shutters themselves, however, are not fireproof shutters. They were simple commercial aluminium vein shutters because commercial sh uh, fire shutters weren't available at the time. And on the eastern side of the building, a slide on the right, there were some pot plants up against the building and the plants burnt and the pots burnt, and the potting mix burnt, which gives us some indication of the, of the intensity of the fire. The building survived, the family survived. About the same time, over on Kangaroo Island, the very first of the fires. So here is a classic example of the three elements working together. Non-combustible building, defensible open ground, and water available to the firefighters for them to take to the fire before it approaches the property. And what we have here is that the fire was contained a few kilometres to the south of this property. Now, I've translated all of that into my own circumstance, where with experience with bushfires over many years, there's been ongoing improvement of the property, starting with the non-combustible building elements, the defensible ground, including a farm fire unit. Now we have three layers of water around the building, and each is expected to fail as the fire approaches. So we can simply step backwards, step by step. The first one is sprinklers, stands operating from mains water, and we expect the mains water pressure to fail simply because fire trucks all have their hoses in every, in every thing in the, in the street. The next layer uh, is uh, hoses on electric fire pump until the public power fails, and then the innermost has hose reels on a petrol driven pump using 120,000 litres of stored water. So it gives us some idea of how, over the decades, thinking about bushfire resistance has changed. There are two columns here of lessons to be learned. On the left are the reminders of what I've just talked about. Worse is yet to come. What we do is about preserving human life rather than the artefacts that we create. And one of the things that's worth noticing is that our Protection of human life is also about our humanity and one of the reasons we do a lot of work about animals and you'll find that just about every fire has an animal as a signature. Clearly, it's about our humanity in play here. And unfortunately, I can also report that at times we see the absolute worst of human beings, looters, people doing disaster tourism, what's called black walks. Um, and sometimes that comes back to haunt them. I'll give you a quick example. I was on a field team. We were putting an animal down on the roadside when a family drove past, who clearly said, let's go for a drive and have a look at those poor people who've been burnt out. And as we fired the gun, I looked at the car and the two kids were looking through the side window and their eyes were the size of saucers. And I always wonder how well they slept. I also wonder what the hell those family thought they were doing. On the right-hand side, if you're offered a bushfire resistance build solution, what due diligence do you have to do? When it says we've had a fire test done, that's not the same thing as saying it passed the fire test. When you get the certificate, is it a Gordy certificate from some country overseas? Does it rely on an opinion or some sort of statement? What value does it have? If it's a, a code mark, look for the little asterisk that talks about all the bits of the code mark that were never tested. Think about the lacrosse building in Melbourne's Dockland. Think about Grenfell Towers. They're the urban equivalents of taking as read a deemed to spy, uh, satisfy a situation that doesn't actually apply. Building owners and occupiers should be clear about their own intentions and be realistic about their ability to carry them through. 
I can no longer do the things I did back at Ash Wednesday, clambering onto the back of the Kerry, fire, Kerry Gully Fire Unit. I'm just not up to it anymore. This means also understanding and practising what the building is offering you. How to operate. Shutters, pumps. Has the pump got fresh fuel in it? I'm not the same person who would have been able to do many of those jobs many, many years ago. When you insure, it's your to realistic levels because the payout, only 60% of that should go to the new building because you're going to have to clear the site. You're going to have to put new accesses in. You're going to have to replace all the services. You've got costs in terms of regulatory approvals and time delays and all those sorts of things. Impacted families, don't rush. Take this at your own pace. Depressurise the process for your own well-being. Feel more good about the fact that you can go and get help and really go and look for it because no matter level of impact, everybody in the community is feeling those impacts. Don't ever think there must be people worse off than me because it isn't true. Give it the time that it needs and deserves and be very sure to capture back the essence of what home was and now apply it to the new reality because the old normal is gone. Architects have valuable skills to contribute, but they're not of the daily bread variety. And they can't be offered unless you have the necessary continuing professional development and accreditations. You need to be registered with State Recovery Office. You need to have got the certificate from Red Cross, which is called Psychological First Aid, so that you know how to talk to people who are, in some situations, quite literally not in their right minds. Offering someone a pro bono design which doesn't meet all of those criteria of being quick to approve, quick to build, and within financial capability, is not a benefit. We're now going full circle and we're back where we started. Because I want to talk to you about the fact that those veterinarians from those four agencies, they got their act together. They are actually accredited people working in fire grounds, contributing their skills as a positive benefit. There are about as many veterinarians in South Australia as there are architects. They mean, the veterinarians know this is about people working together. Stepping up to bushfire means going to places that Arctic have never been before and we have a large, long road to go if we want to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much to Emilis for his presentation and highlighting many aspects of how uh, people in South Australia and across Australia can approach preparations for the inevitability of increasing intensity of the fires as, um, as within going into the future. Uh, very much appreciate the sharing of um, many aspects of how the various properties um, will have to uh, adapt and check off on different, very different aspects of becoming more bushfire resilient, as well as making sure that their um, homes are set up with the right equipment as well as accessibility uh, when these uh, situations occur. I think one of the big, uh, greatest aspect is also knowing that um, you are also part of a, uh, a wider community to make sure that there's greater uh, fire fitness and um, bushfire resiliency in this, uh, in this area. And uh, bushfire resiliency isn't just a singular um, situation and consideration. It's also about how everyone is working together. We hope that all of you have gained valuable knowledge and insight in this specific area through this present presentation. Uh, as a pre-recording, we will not have a Q&A session uh, wrap up, to wrap up the session as we usually do in our in-person uh, events. Uh, however, rather, as we've said before, um, we'll be conducting a follow-up session with Emlis later on. Uh, if you haven't added any of your com uh, questions or comments into the chat screen, chat stream, stream, sorry, uh, um, please make sure you shoot us. You can also shoot us an email at info at adelaidesbn.com.au or through our Facebook Messenger, um, and we'll try to once again we will collate those so we can actually create a uh, response to various questions. Uh, on behalf of the ASBN team. Uh, I would very much like to thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to hosting uh, another session with you all in the near future. Thank you. Have a great day.